Welcome, uh, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, happy to be with you and delighted for me to be with uh, Steve Collar, uh, CEO of SES, as, as mentioned by Alexandra. So, Steve, uh, welcome to this discussion. Very happy to have you. Um, and um, I think as, as our time is, is limited, I I think we'll enter straight into our, our discussion topics for today. So, Steve, as a, as a matter of introduction to our discussion, I mean, SES has been leader in connectivity for years and very much involved in digital. So, when I think at, at the industry as it is, we have entered in that terabit environment for the global uh, satellite connectivity industry. Uh, and at the same time, throughout the all, all the economic activity, I think maybe today 90% of organizations are using cloud in one form or another and digital overall. So just to get started and giving you the mic, uh, we'd be interested in having your first vision on connectivity as is used to be defined for our industry, cloud digital, and how do you see that live together or converge moving forward? Yeah, hey, Pekom and Pakom, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, this series. Um, look, we we made a very conscious decision as an organization that we wanted to be cloud first. And for us, that meant a few different things. But using the cloud for our own digital transformation, using the cloud to enhance the capabilities that we have in broadcast. Um, and a lot of our play out now is actually done uh, from the cloud rather than from on-prem, which has been a big, big transformation, I think both for us and for our customers. But as you say, I think the main area where we see the um, the value and the interest is sort of bringing together, We, I've always had, we've always had this view that, you know, satellite standalone is interesting, but it's much more interesting when it's integrated into kind of larger ecosystems, whether that be sort of telco and mobile, or whether that be in this case, cloud and cloud, probably even more powerful than, than 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 the telco domain and in telco what we look to do is you know integrate within the uh, sort of you know automation and the delivery of network functions across the network making our network look like an extension of a of a of a terrestrial network of a telco network with cloud like i say i think it's even more interesting because our customers get direct access to the cloud we're sort of let's say one hop away our customers are one hop away from azure one hop away from from aws and and that's really powerful and a number of our customers are very interesting for the cloud service providers and, and because we have this really high performing connectivity particularly when we leverage what we have in in mio with the o3b constellation it becomes a very very compelling proposition so customers can really leverage the power of the cloud get those insights back into their business get access to machine learning get access to sort of insights that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise be able to do and that makes their business more profitable more efficient easier to run more connected and and those things in today's world because you know it can be the difference between, you know, very significant capability, very significant profitability or not, particularly for, you know, complicated operations, whether that be for a, you know, a commercial maritime operator that's, you know, looking to use those insights, whether that be for an airline that's sort of attempting to get, you know, 95% of data that's generated on board planes is still not brought off those planes until they land, which is, which is kind of crazy. So I think there's a long way to go. Uh, and the trick for us is making sure that we're, you know, our network is leveraging and integrated in the cloud in a, in a way that makes sense for customers, which is why we're building, you know, our on ramps to empower directly in into the cloud We're building them at, you know, in the, in the facilities of the cloud, the cloud service providers, which I think will make our network more valuable, make us more interesting and relevant to our customers. Yes, because in, in, in that environment, and, and as you mentioned, there, there are the two parts, there are the operations, and maybe there are, is also kind of the, the, the contractual relationship or, or what we used to call a SLA, maybe in the connectivity that may change if it's more of an end-to-end -end cloud, cloud experience. But so if, if I think or, or from the, the findings or discussions that you have had with clients, so in terms of the benefits compared to the typical connectivity, I don't know, uh, latency and access to the cloud that clients could experience. Um, 
So what what do you see as the actual core benefit? And I think you, you touched on that for a client, but what does it change compared to what he used to do? And in terms of uh, that use of the cloud applications, do you see increasing sensitivity to latency because of synced operations or other aspects? Or what kind of the two to three areas where you see really a, kind of a breakthrough or added value in that combination or, or locating the, the ground stations, as you mentioned? Yeah, I think in off, you know it's it's a it's a mixture of things. It's high performance connectivity definitely makes a difference, and so where you know, and that's a combination of bandwidth and latency. And so for us, but you know that unique we, Empower and and Mio in general does really well when we're talking about high flexibility, high throughput, and that that really lends itself well to cloud and getting secure cloud connectivity at the edge. So taking you know, cloud services and cloud capabilities and taking them to the edge of the network, which is where a lot of our customers operate, whether they be government customers, you know, air, you know, airlines, um, maritime customers. And so, uh, and, and, and I think, yeah, it's, it's making it easy for our customers first and foremost. So in, in a couple of cases, actually, you know, we found that we were um, partnering with a customer and in this case, Microsoft were partnering with a customer sort of independently and we ended up bringing those relationships together. And now either we deliver, um, you know, services to, to the, those end users, leveraging Microsoft at our, in our gateways or the other way around. And so sometimes it's just making it simple for our customers. Yeah. Oftentimes it's the ability to offer a completely different set of services towards our customers. It's, it's strange that even now and today, what we find is a bunch of pretty sophisticated um, customers don't necessarily know how much more valuable or how much more value they can create by having more and more of their data in the cloud, by having more uh, more access to cloud services. In some cases, that's because they didn't realize it was it was possible, and in other cases, just because they haven't uh, sort of they're, they're further behind in their digital transformation journey. And so just having the conversations and sort of engaging with our customers around what's possible in the cloud. We just did some demonstrations for some government customers who, you know, and governments are increasingly thinking about the power of the cloud and importantly secure cloud and how they can leverage that uh, in the sort of remote areas in which they they tend to operate. And so, yeah, I think it it is really transformational in terms of capabilities and um, what our customers can do with, you know, it, it goes way beyond just base connectivity. This is now access to services and solutions that, you know, were, they didn't necessarily think were possible. Yeah, for sure, yeah, from uh, from public to private cloud to, to the service layers. Yeah, for sure, there's, there's quite a universe of possible and, and it's disruptive for the operation of any organization in terms of uh, data management, no doubt. Yeah. So, if I think, and, and we may move to also what what you see as, as disruptions for Empower, but also in view of, of what you mentioned. So I know that you've announced and your team has announced uh, the deployment of the first ground stations typically for, for Empower uh, in recent months, and some of them located, as you mentioned, in uh, Azure locations or, or data center locations. So, uh thinking forward beyond that first development and thinking of where, where traffic would be in the future so it could suggest that over time just as data centers have moved closer to the users there you could have a potentially a form of extension on the network to optimize that latency and access to data centers so uh maybe a word on empower and, and really coming you know getting yeah. close to that <laughs> Yeah, what you see as the description there and maybe the topology of the network as, as it may grow. Yeah, look, I mean, we're super excited, as you can imagine, with, with Empower. It's, it really feels like it's around the corner. We've got a, uh, some customer events next month uh, already in, in Boeing's factory in El Segundo, where we're going to take customers around and have them look at hardware. I was going to say touch and feel, but maybe we'll avoid the touching and feeling bit. But, um, day, maybe, you yeah. know, really, <laughs> really important for our customers to... Um, understand that that this is happening that these satellites are, are coming down the pike we're still on track for a launch this year which is which is great getting the the first one off is always the the hardest and then you know the next launches will follow so yeah i mean with with empower we've taken a, a successful um 
you know, successful operation, successful service that we've now been delivering with with the, the sort of O3B Classic constellation for close on 10 years and we've scaled it ridiculously. So we've 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 looked at, you know, one of the brilliant things that O3B enabled us to do was 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 provide completely game changing services sort of anywhere we wanted to and anywhere our customers needed us but we couldn't deliver those services simultaneously to lots and lots of users we were limited by the number of beams that we had available on on, on board the classic satellite so we've addressed that we've gone from 10 beams per satellite to 5000 beams per satellite and so a ridiculous scaling in terms of our ability to serve the market and so you say why is that interesting well you know, we're number one in cruise. We we deliver a vastly superior service in cruise than anyone else, which is why we're on the top kind of 50 cruise ships uh, that sail. There are 600 cruise ships, right? And so now we, you know, we go from being uh, sort of number one serving 50 cruise ships to potentially serving the entire market. And you can go market by market and take that same thought process and say, okay, we've we've had to pick and choose where we land our beams with O3B. We don't have to do that anymore. So that's sort of one important advantage I would say we've we've addressed. Terminals is another one. So, you know, we've 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 put a lot of thought into how do we make integrated terminals, sort of single technologies that go right the way across our networks. So that if a customer has, you know, O3B Empower technology, they can use that same technology to get access to geo, that those terminals themselves are simple and, and affordable. And that will make a huge difference, I think, to, uh, to Empower. The third is the efficiency. So we've now built a space brain, which basically allows us to uh, instantaneously move power and bandwidth across the system. And that's dramatic because what it means is you don't lose efficiency in the network anywhere. You're always using all of the power and bandwidth that's available on the network. And we can, like I say, we can do this sort of uh, semi-autonomously and certainly extremely adapt, you know, to, to adapt the, na the, the network to the needs. And then obviously we've got a lot more bandwidth and capability. So it's the first sort of terabit per second uh, system that'll be commercially available. And that will give us a completely different set of tools in which to serve our customers. And where Mio is really interesting is again, if you think about a quadrant and sort of on one axis, you've got flexibility and on the other axis, you've got throughput or bandwidth. Mio and Empower really plays well in the high flexibility, high throughput quadrant. Leo typically plays in the low flexibility, low, low bandwidth quadrant, which doesn't make it better or worse. It just makes it different. And that's really interesting from our standpoint, because high flexibility, high bandwidth plays very well to some of the more interesting segments that I think we're going to have intrinsic advantages to serve, whether that be cruise or Navy or ISR or cloud. You know, we were just talking about the cloud connectivity. Uh, and so I think there'll be a great market for Leo. Uh, but there'll be a really interesting market for us at Mio and, and, and in medium earth orbit where uh, we're pretty unique. And, and I, I think uh, if we think about the, the economics of the industry, the flexibility compared to the move towards, you know, higher broadband, let's say type satellites in the last decade is, is I think one of the key for the economics of the industry in this new decade to try to find a trade-off between even more bandwidth and the economics to have the efficiency for the clients, but I assume also in terms of economics for the operators of the network. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. But I think for, for us, at least, it's the combination of the two because it's not just about delivering lower cost per bit. It's 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 doing it in an intelligent way and delivering the kinds of services that, that customers really need. And so, you know, I think there's no, a lot, a lot of what I just described about bandwidth and, and flexibility comes almost from the architectures. With Leo, as you get closer to the earth, you know, you, you reduce latency, but you increase the number of satellites and your network tends to be defined by the capability of any individual satellite. And that makes it harder to shift stuff around. It, you know, you have a relatively even distribution of power and bandwidth on a global basis. It's a bit like an evenly spread mobile network. Whereas what we're able to do is actually direct, you know, our, our mobile network towards the big cities and have less in, in areas that where there's where there's limited demand. And, and so, uh, and that really just comes from the fact that we're further away from the earth and we can direct power and bandwidth in a more uh, dynamic and, and I would say sort of intelligent way. And that, that's really exciting because what it that enables then is a different set of services and a different set of capabilities that we can deliver to customers and should should put us in a in a good spot when it comes to 
serving the, 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 the part of the market that we feel uh, we can serve well. And I assume obviously that this is, is you know, pretty deep transformation actually of, of the operations will uh, uh, you know, result in, in uh, an ecosystem in motion. So you mentioned about cloud as a partners, but obviously there's the ecosystem of either the local or, or vertical and, and other partners. So with that form of, of flexibility, traffic, volumes, et cetera, I think it will, it implies some, some thinking and, and review and different ways of working with, with the overall ecosystem of partners that you would have. It, it does, um, but it but it's also we I we, I would say we're only solving maybe twenty or thirty percent more challenges than than before, if you know what I mean. So we've already got a constellation. We've solved the orbit, the handover, the you know how how our customer services react. Uh, it's it's great that we can already do demonstrations on O3B Classic with a view towards O3B Empower. So we've got three different demos going on with navies around the world, sort of proving out the services in advance of, of Empower showing up. And, you know, the same is true for ISR. ISR is a market segment that we think, you know, we can play particularly strongly in. And, and, and that's one of the biggest drivers of, of, of demand on the government side. And so the fact that we can, we can already prove all of, you know, let's say 70% of the of the capabilities across across classic and then you know the additional sort of 20 30 percent that comes as a result of the fact that we're now operating a full digital payload we've got digital beam forming on board so that we can you know stand up beams and take them down we can demonstrate once we've got empower up there we can demonstrate our ability to um you know avoid either intentional or un unintentional interference there's a lot of interesting capabilities that we have when when empower launches that we'll be able to prove then uh, but you know most of the system is pretty pretty much you know like for like with o3b which is great because it means that as i say we can focus on the the higher end value that we're able to deliver on empower thank you and uh maybe rebounding on, on what you you mentioned on on navies or isr but maybe uh, bringing it to to a larger extent to sovereignty so mm. uh, obviously there's been four years a consideration from i mean various countries for civilian purpose but also potentially for for defense or even intelligence purpose there's been use of of satellite connectivity there's been use of commercial satellite connectivity obviously in, in a large way for years um, which is always a consideration of the balance of any uh, patrimonial national needs or how to use and work with with the commercial system. So one of the changes, obviously, is that most nations around the world uh, would not have proprietary NGSO capabilities for connectivity just because of the scales and size and global and, and so forth. Um, and while this being said, uh, they may continue to have some uh, thinking around how to manage my uh, sovereignty requirement, how to make it compatible with the way I want to have traffic, manage my information and so forth. So um, as you mentioned, I mean, navies have tested and I know there's been RFI and even contracts uh, for Australia already with US defense, for example, and, and right. it's not the only nation for sure. But when thinking of, of that issue of sovereignty and countries that may want to leverage NGSO, but how to make them comfortable, you know, how to make that happen. Um, how do you see the way forward here and how to, yeah. Yeah, look, so it's a really interesting area and, and, and we see this reflected, I think, in the thinking of Europe with the, the European Commission project. Uh, but, but I would say governments around the world are thinking about, you know, sovereign, sovereignty and how they get access to secure capabilities, um, you know, in, in multi-orbit, right? Because I think the reality for most governments is they probably need access to all orbits to some degree and, and how you can do that in, in a way that is secure and sovereign is tricky. And, and again, I think we have some architectural advantages in medium earth orbit. Again, we're not in MEO by accident, we, we kind of picked it, right? And so one of, one of the real benefits is with only three or four gateways, you can get global coverage. And if you, if you have a kind of a, a network where you have, you know, let's say a, a sovereign gateway in sovereign territory that access the constellation and then delivers service, you can effectively establish a truly 
private network that no one else gets access to. So it's not only secure from the perspective of, you know, secure access to cloud or capability, it can actually be secure in that nobody else touches the network. And so, you know, the only investment the government would need to make to have global coverage uh, that is truly secure rather than accessing, you know, uh, our commercial gateways is a relatively small investment in, in gateways and then the ability to scale the network so we can effectively deliver a sovereign MEO network to any government that wants it. And I would say there's even a step beyond that, which is, you know, the MEO network is incredibly scalable. And so we have the ability to continue to launch satellites and ultimately within a limit, we can we can deliver, you know, an entirely sovereign, including dedicated satellite networks in MEO. Trying to do that in LEO, I, I'm not even sure where you'd begin, because again, the power of LEO is that you've got kind of one network and, and you have to you have to launch hundreds, if not thousands of satellites. And so how you carve out pieces of that network for a given customer is much, much harder to think about. So, yeah, I think this is an issue that a lot of governments are thinking about. Uh, it's not easy for um, too many governments to build their own sovereign NGSO system. And I think we provide an on-ramp to, to governments as they think about how they can get access to the kind of services that we can deliver from MEO. Thank you. And maybe two related topics. So, I mean, what, one is the cloud and, and some form of transformation of what's acceptable. And again, you know, sovereignty government can go from mm. civil really to, uh, to, to deep defense um, uh, or even intelligence activities. Uh, another one that may come to my mind that it kind of the end-to-end -end scheme are the user terminals that you mentioned. And typically I, I had the opportunity, well, quite recently to to have a look at the situation in the US. And, and the fact is that they are now almost uh, at the start of a major modernization cycle of all the equipment that was mm -hmm. has been put out there around, I don't know, 27 to 13 during the last major operations. And all of that is coming to the end of a life cycle and they have to think of what's next. And I've seen some studies, some RFIs will go around, okay, we need some new equipment that can leverage maybe different orbits or frequencies, but okay, some equipment is dual, tri-band, whatever we need yeah. to do. So in that kind of environment, are you also working with certain um, you know, equipment vendors or in general to as well include the ability to work with the constellation in that context? Okay. Yeah, I mean, our, our ambition is that we're building a global network where any terminal on that network can access any one of our assets, right? So just from an SES standpoint, we, we think our network is much more valuable if there's a terminal that can see our MEO, that can see our GEO assets, and where customers can go relatively flexibly between them. So for now, you know, we have this space brain that's sort of managing O3BM power and SES 17, but in the future, the space brain is going to manage every single one of our assets. And we'll be able to kind of move customers and even actually flexibly route, you know, latency insensitive traffic over geo and late latency sensitive traffic over Mio into the same terminal. It's, it, you know, the, the sort of the, the possibilities of how we can deliver services grow pretty quickly if a single terminal can access multiple, multiple assets and particularly multiple assets simultaneously. And this is now, I would say, a reality where it wasn't necessarily the case before. Uh, so that's our vision, let's say, internal to our own network, but that also means we can extend that to governments. And so, um, you know, O3BM Power can look like an extension of a geo-sovereign uh, asset, whether that be US or UK, you know, most, most of the kind of, uh, if you look in the US and across most of Europe, there are a number of um, Milsatcom systems, which actually look you know, can 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 look like an extension of Empower and vice versa. And so we can kind of into a MEO environment, extend the experiences of um, of government customers. And, and I think it has real power. I mean, I've talked to you before about, you know, how do we solve this issue of, of return on invested capital in the industry where, you know, we've got a lot of investment going on and it's all relatively incoherent. Well, if we can sort of combine networks virtually, uh, and have customers able to roam onto, you know, other people's assets. That means we don't necessarily have to go invest in the same place that they are and vice versa. And, you know, we, we deliver better services to customers and everybody's profitability improves. So I think there's a whole bunch of interesting things that come as a result of, you know, thinking of our network as one big network where terminals, you know, we've got 
technology that runs through the system. It's the same technology on, on Mio as it is in Geo, and terminals can access either. That then becomes quite powerful in the context of integrating with, let's say, third party systems. And I, I think you know, it's been true for governments at large, let's say, in the past, but would it be because of, of some uh, network constraints or because or for civilian or, or some budget constraints? I think in many cases, uh, data rates and actually information transfer was was pretty low. I mean, just having in mind how many people you may have on a Navy ship and on a cruise ship, maybe or even a smaller ship, um, the range maybe, I don't know, not maybe a hundred fold, but uh, 20 to 50 fold at least compared to what was the case until at least quite recently, if not today. Mm. Um, so in the testing you do, even or in terms of unlocking or the potential latent bandwidth and information tra transmission requirements, is it really kind of a, of a major change in terms of the requirement compared to, to status quo, let's say, or what? It's, it's really it's really interesting. I mean, our, our first experience of this was with Cruise back with 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 O3B Classic, where um, you know we we were sort of having conversations at the. It, it, where we were kind of looking at links on board cruise ships of 10 to 20 megabits shared with you know the entire ship <clears throat> and when we sort of said look we can bring you know we can bring 200 300 400 megabits to to a ship um most of the cruise operators said we're never going to need that and so we we started to deploy it and we're at a gig now right so and that's not unusual you, what you find and 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 now guests are fantastically happy the cruise lines are fantastically happy of course they're spending more on their bandwidth and their connectivity they're not spending you know the the same multiple in terms of the amount of bandwidth that they're getting and you know the service is 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 it, the what you can do with a lot more high performance bandwidth is now is sort of understood but it's often only understood when you've actually deployed it and i think we're having that same experiences with navy right now we've got you know a number of i would call them high performance trials that aren't just about connectivity they're also linking into cloud and other sort of terrestrially based services and enabling different functions and a completely different level of situational awareness and if you've never had it you didn't know that you needed it you didn't know that you were missing it but uh those sorts of capabilities you know and it definitely comes with the ability to deliver I would say a different kind of, of connectivity, both in terms of the aggregate amount of throughput per user, but also the way in that, you know, the, the performance of that connection and what it's enabling uh, in terms of sort of the, 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 the connectivity, the reach back. Thanks. And uh, I see that we are already getting close to the end of our time. So if I hear you correctly as well, you know, it's, it's kind of a disruptive environment and, and change, but it, it takes as well a lot of, of trial i'm not i don't always like the educational but really testing understanding the uh the client's process for their digital let's say current status of operations and to work with them on on that digital path so it, it, more than just traditional connectivity there's a lot of efforts to engage with clients and work with them on their information management more or less yeah and i think the the range is big in terms of you know some 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 clients definitely you know, wanna wanna test it, wanna 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 prove it, kind of thing. Others are ahead of us, and they drag us into this. I would, you know, our, our relationship with with Carnival, and in particular the the Innovation Center and John, John Padgett at Carnival. You know, as soon as he understood what kind of capability we could bring, he was already thinking about how does that enable you know cloud type services that I'm going to offer on board. A complete, you know, so he rolled out the medallion system that. That meant that you know everyone got a medallion. It tracked them. It delivered different level of service to them, and all of that ended up being honed back in the cloud and was only possible you know because of the kind of connectivity we can bring. So you know there's a range. Some 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 customers are like, okay, I get it. Now now just let me figure out what I can do with it. And for others, it takes a little bit more um, you know sort of demonstration, I would say. But uh, but the, the exciting thing is that there's real value here. I think space has never been more strategic. I think. It's gonna. It's just gonna. It's just gonna accelerate, and um, and that that that's exciting for all of us. It means that we're right in the center of uh, of some really interesting stuff that's going on in the sort of the broad ecosystem of cloud and telco. It it looks like, and I'm uh, very happy to be able to talk with you right in the middle of it. So I think that's thanks thanks for sharing uh, all those insights. Looks exciting. A uh, few months to go to to empower, as you said. So. Uh, 
certainly uh, will be uh, we'll be looking at that and this uh, entire transformation and growth in in this uh, digital ecosystems. 